educational solutions. And I'm here with uh, Rick uh, E. Benedetti, who is a teacher, visits teacher up in uh, Streetsville Secondary School in Mississauga. Um, we were going to do this as an on-site presentation at uh, Rick's school, an in-class presentation. Um, but uh, we're struggling with the Wi-Fi up there, so we had to quickly reschedule to, to have the session down here with the one um, complication that apparently there's a very stringent contract that doesn't allow Rick out of the school before 3 10, so I guess 10 to 3. So he had, he had to race down here uh, to make it today, so hopefully he didn't get a ticket. Um, so uh, today, uh, uh, Rick's, uh, Rick's presentation is going to be on an introduction to kinematics, so not just an introduction to kinematics, but actually an introduction to using the technology. Uh, Rick has had an opportunity to use this in his classroom now for a couple of years. He is one of the early adopters of the uh, of the smart carts, so he probably has as much experience as anyone in, in using the, the carts uh, with with uh, a classroom of kids. And and Rick is intending to do a, a series of webinars um, that will progress through you know the the introduction of using kinematics, uh, using the carts with kinematics, to presumably later on to some dynamics investigations with the grade 12 pupils and so forth. We haven't really defined those uh, other 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 presentations yet that they will be following. Um, so I think it's going to be a, an interesting presentation. It's not going to be a presentation that will show you everything you can possibly do with the smart card. It's going to be actually a presentation is focusing on how little you really need to know about the technology to make uh, to make a big impact with the students. Uh, one of the things that uh, Bert has had to deal with is, is like many of our, many teachers out there, is not an overflowing science budget. So he hasn't had all the, the, you know, the perfect scenario for, for equipment with, with you know, all the tracks and all the parts, but he's managed to sort of evolve his program based on the technology that he's had available. And he's gonna show you uh, also, you know, tricks on, on, on how to stretch your science budget as far as what you need to get started and how you can augment to that maybe over time when, when, when budget dollars are, are more available. So without further ado, um, I hope that did justice as an introduction for what you're going to do, Rick. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and so I'll hand it over to Rick and uh, let him uh, do his thing, okay? Uh, we should also start to... Um, Okay, so there we go. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, if a teacher is planning to uh, allow the students the latitude to uh, explore the concepts of position, velocity, and acceleration using this equipment. It's going to take more time than, than we normally allocate to, to such an introduction. I just can't reserve that. Uh, I'm just getting used to this. Um, so much more time would be needed. So any inquiry approach ends up uh, uh, requiring uh, the teacher to reduce the, the details in the curriculum. Um, and that different teachers, depending what they want to accomplish in the classroom, decide to, to, uh, to reduce the curriculum in different ways. I've met teachers, for example, who don't, don't do any projectile motion at all in grade 11. They bump it up to grade 12 completely. And uh, to make more room for, say, another unit, let's say more, more, more time for magnetism, for example. Well, even within uh, kinematics and dynamics, uh, there's always a trade-off between uh, uh, the, the number of concepts and, and, and how deeply they need to be covered or, or they're going to be covered and, um, and how much time is available. Uh, so um, the biggest problem that I found myself over the years of, of trying to implement any particular inquiry approach for a certain topic, because I don't do it all the time, um, uh, was to just psychologically accept that, that I'm... I'm going to be going through less curriculum. And uh, once I accepted that, that took a lot of pressure off and uh, allowed me to plan accordingly. Uh, so I had to make some decisions about where I would cut back in terms of the details. Um, and um, so uh, that's the first point. 
The second point, and those are personal decisions. The teachers, uh, uh, individual teachers will decide for themselves where they want to cut back in terms of uh, the, the rigor that they introduce into the course, the physics course in grade 11. Um, now, in terms of what we do, what I do with my students, uh, the other thing is besides cutting back on, on, on the amount of uh, details that I cover, um, I minimize the instructions and I for sure don't have any detailed analysis initially when they're exploring a topic. Now, analysis can come later, um, but uh, the more instructions I feel that I give my students, uh, the more unlikely they are to explore the concepts. Um, most of them, not all, of course, we all know we have a range of students. Some don't follow instructions at all, uh, but most do. And um, uh, so if I give them too many instructions, I've laid out like a standard lab for them. And it just won't, it, it'll work as a standard lab, but it won't be inquiry. And the students will, will limit their own explorations. When they have minimal instructions, just enough to keep the equipment safe and for them to actually know a little bit what to do with the software and the equipment. Um, then their imagination, what I've noticed is that they get more imaginative. Not that I planned for that, it's just I've noticed that's what happens. And uh, so that's reinforced uh, my thoughts in terms of continuing with this approach, not with every particular topic, uh, but for sure with introducing kinematics, because there's some um, deeply entrenched misconceptions about kinematics. Um, and, and any physics teacher uh, who's had any kind of experience teaching physics would know that um, the words we have in the English language are used in a variety of ways in English. They don't, but they have much more specific meaning in physics. And uh, so that leads to um, like what I referred to just before as entrenched misconceptions. So velocity is not speed, at least it is in real life, but <laughs> in, in physics, uh, when we talk about velocity, we include direction. And this whole idea of what happened, acceleration is also a word that causes a big problem. Uh, some teachers have refused to use the word decelerate, um, except it's out there, it's, it's in the wild. And, and so people use it, they've heard it before. And so I don't mind using it, except that I often remind students to be careful. Um, in the, the word decelerate usually means slow down. Uh, in physics, technically, and, I, and I, we go back and forth on this in class. Uh, so I keep reminding them that we will talk about accelerations and uh, acceleration can include speeding up and slowing down. And, um, and I, I address that in particular You'll see what, when, when I go into the tasks I ask students to do with, with, the, with the smart cards. What's beautiful about the smart cards is there's no cables, there's no wires. Uh, so the students are free to just uh, to correlate what happens on a graph as time goes by of position or velocity or acceleration or two or three of them at a time. Uh, they correlate that with what they're doing with the cart, how the cart's moving. Partly when their hand is on the cart, and also when, what I, what, I, what I tell my students is when nature is moving the cart. So if it's just rolling up and down a ramp, but you're not touching it, that's one kind of situation, one kind of motion. The other kind is when you're actually shoving the cart or stopping the cart, and then your hand is involved. And that changes what the trace looks like. And our textbooks traditionally don't show that. They show perfect graphs. And, uh, and that's not what happens in real life. And um, so uh, to go on, um, the third thing I would mention in terms of accommodations for an inquiry approach is uh, allow yourself to just circulate without giving too many what we call answers to the students. So uh, when, when I circulate, when you're actually using the smart cart and, and the smart view software, um, I check to see what their runs look like uh, on the graphs, on their screens. And I often ask them just, okay, redo the run. Uh, uh, if I see what might have caused the problem particular run, or it's not showing what I, what I was hoping, um, I might make some suggestions to the students to try something a little bit different with the cart. Um, and, and they're quite happy to run it again. Um, and you'll see, we'll, we'll demonstrate that using the cart in just a few minutes, 
and uh, you can accumulate a large number of rents, and uh, uh, which is okay. Uh, I tell the students not to worry about that. Uh, they can always delete runs if they get too crowded, and uh, I show them how to do that as well. Uh, what I also mostly do, actually, when I circulate amongst the students when they're working with SparkView and the smart cards, uh, is to ask them to describe in their own words um, what what uh, what motion of the cart corresponds to different sections of a graph. So the zigzags in the graph is a velocity graph going up or down or horizontally or something, simply with acceleration or position. And so I might point to a certain section of, of a trace that they have, and uh, whether I like it or not doesn't matter. And I say, what was the cart doing there? Do you remember? And, and if they say, no, we don't, then I say, okay, we'll run it again and see. And, they, and they'll see the trace happening while the cart's moving. And they can do it more than once. And they can delete rounds if it gets too crowded. So it's not a problem, uh, but it takes time. It, it takes quite a bit of time. And they do need time to get used to just handling the materials as well and a little bit to get used to the software. So what I typically do is when I first introduce this to students, uh, introduce the equipment to the students, uh, not the concepts, uh, I, uh, I take me half a period uh, just to very quickly have them get, put their hands on the cart. Uh, now I use iPads in my school. You can use iPads or computers or Chromebooks. Um, and we happen to have a card of iPads, so, so I'm left unfortunate that way. Uh, the whole school shares them, and so I can book them out of the library and, and use them uh, for this purpose. Um, but uh, I give the students maybe at the most 20 minutes the first time, just to put their hands on the cart, to give me one run, uh, just to see if they have any glitches in using software. And I just deal with that initially. And I tell them, don't worry if, you, if nothing makes sense at the moment. Well, well, first thing tomorrow morning or first thing tomorrow afternoon, the very next class, we'll, we'll have the entire period to use the smart cards. And so far, that's worked well for me, and that's, and that's what I keep doing. Um, now, in terms of the activities themselves, the logistics for the activities, the materials I use, first of all, I, uh, the, car, the smart cards are expensive. Uh, they're, they're a fantastic piece of equipment uh, for this, this particular webinar, and, and when I first introduced this to students, I don't use the force sensor, but there is one in there. Uh, there's a variety of sensors in the smart card. I'm only using the position sensor. So one of the axles has some, some uh, equipment uh, embedded in it so that when the axle and the wheel turns, um, the, the, the little computer chip inside, uh, along with the software in, inside the smart card, together with SparkView, um, will keep track of position. That's it. It will calculate velocities, it will calculate accelerations for you and for the students. So they don't, they don't have to worry about that part. Um, but before I start any of this, I do introduce a little bit, not a lot, no calculations or hardly any, um, what position means versus displacement, um, what velocity means, uh, just in terms of velocity, this, this they don't see that a problem with it. The acceleration is the, is the, is the big uh, problem. But velocity as, a, as how quickly your position is changing, that they seem fine with. Uh, they may not have used the formula, average velocity equals uh, delta D over delta T. But it, uh, if I just talk about a school bus, try driving at 60 kilometers an hour for three hours, how far does it go? They can answer that. So they're okay with that. Um, so I introduce just basically what position means, what velocity means, what acceleration means. If they have directions, I don't get into the meaning of the directions necessarily. Um, what I do point out, uh, and I didn't fully realize this until this year. It's kind of interesting. I've taught a lot of years, but um, you can always learn things. Uh, negative 10, as far as they're concerned initially, is less than negative 5. And uh, on a number line, that's what they learned in math, and it's perfectly correct. But a velocity of negative 10 meters per second compared to a velocity of negative 5 meters per second, the negative sign is not an amount, it's a direction. And so we focus on that to all the activities. And the way, and so that, uh, so minus signs, negativity, 
to predict a, a positive value for acceleration or position or velocity. Um, the way I, I, I've approached that this year is I've explicitly asked them that whatever runs they do with the smart car. So here's one, for example, a red one. Um, I have them do exactly the same run, which means the same action, the same motion with the car, okay? With the car facing one way, and then they do it again, a new run on the software, turning the car around. So one way is forward, one way is backward. And it turns out just for your own information, and it's easy to tell the students this, too. There's a plunger on here, which can be used for activities where two cars are springing apart from each other, for example. And so uh, for this set of, of activities, I don't use the plunger. It tends to release prematurely. So um, I just I show that to students. I just say, look, don't leave it sticking out. This is breakable more so than the cart, and push it back in. And uh, but the plunger is like a tail instead of a nose. It's a tail on the cart, and uh, so that's the back end of the cart. That's backwards in that direction, and so that's how they can. And, and that they caught on to really quickly. So now they know which way is forward, which way is positive as far as the cart is concerned. The, the, the electronics inside the cart. So um, now the other end has a magnetic bumper. So what I'll go over now quickly is what I tell the students in terms of the cart to keep the cart safe. Um, the magnetic bumper at the front has a metal pin on one side. And um, I think at one, now the, the smart carts I've got are part of a, gr a group of smart carts. We have a, a kit of eight that uh, are shared amongst three or four schools. So one time the kid came back from another school and one of those pins was broken. Now students will start fiddling with their carts. And so I warned that, so I give them a few warnings ahead of time. I explain how expensive it is. I tell them it's 320 some odd dollars plus shipping plus tax. And uh, so they, that they seem quite impressed with it. That's a lot of money even for them. And uh, so, so then I give them some safety advice. So keep the plunger at the crest. Um, and don't fiddle with the magnetic bumper. So don't unscrew it, don't screw it too tight either, just leave it alone. And uh, if it's loose, tighten it a little bit, but that's it. And so far that's worked well. Uh, and very simple instructions to follow. The other thing I tell them about safety of the cart, that's just two very important things. All the work done with the carts at the day 11 is on the floor, never on desks or on the bench. It's, it's, it's quite a drop to the to a hard floor, and I don't want to avoid damage to the cart. So they work, and that's worked really well as well. They can work in the hallway just outside the classroom, or they can on the floor of the classroom. I also, when they put the cart down, especially if they're like, finished or, you know, they've stood up and they're, they're sitting at the desk again, if they put it on the desk, but even on the floor, I, I have them invert it so the wheels are sticking up. And then it can't, it can't roll on them and, and fall off the desk, or somebody, you know, somebody actually accidentally steps on it uh, or, or bumps it. It is, it's not going to slip from under their feet. It will just drag a little bit. Uh, so that's essentially, uh, no, and I point out the power button on the side. Uh, there's three little ports on the side. One's the charging port. One is some kind of accessory port for mechanically attaching uh, devices that maybe haven't come out yet from Pasco that are being designed. And then there's a power button. It's not labeled, but it's a, just a round black button. You just push it, it turns the card on. And that's it. So when you push the button, the cart comes on, there's a, a, the battery light flashes once, and then the Bluetooth button, uh, I'll hold this out, I don't know if you can see it on, on the screen or not, but it, it'll flash, it'll be, the, the Bluetooth uh, light will be uh, flashing red. So that means it's active, okay? And so um, that's what I say about the cart. When the cart's on, it's sending signals, and it's communicating with whoever wants to listen to it or whatever wants to listen to it. Then I give them a little bit of advice about SparkView. We point out a few of its many features. And this I keep, uh, I describe the minimum of features so they can accomplish uh, for the next three days what I want them to accomplish. And it's not that many features, it's really easy to get into. Uh, so if you see on the screen now, um, Craig, the bottom half of their screen, is that, will it match what I see on the screen there? Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're seeing, when you first turn SparkView on, you're, you're seeing the window that says Pasco in the top left corner there. That's the entire screen you see with the blue heading across the top, the blue bar across the top, okay? 
And then, so if you go over to where it says build, you gotta connect. Uh, actually, you gotta connect for it. So I click on the Bluetooth symbol up here. So I show them this. Now, to show them this, it, it would be nice. And so I'm fortunate. We, we have iPads and we have Apple TVs and we have a projector in each, in each of our science rooms. So um, you can get, uh, no, with the iPad, I've got to use Apple TV to project it. Uh, if you're using a laptop, uh, you might need a Bluetooth dongle to plug into one of the USB ports uh, so that it can communicate with uh, the smart card. Um, I'm not sure whether a brand new laptop, like a Microsoft, like a Windows laptop, whether the Bluetooth is, is appropriate. Craig, would you know? Okay. If you have a brand new laptop, something modern, um, do you need the dongle to connect to the... No, if it's a Windows 10. Okay, so Windows 10 would work. Any Windows 10? And most, yeah, yeah, and most, um, okay. and all new Macs. So you might have to experiment with a little bit of that to make the connection. Uh, the first year I did this was last year. And uh, you're, you're able to get a trial version. I think it's good for 30 days or 60 days or something like that, maybe even 90 days, but uh, of Spark View on a computer. Otherwise, you have to buy it. It's free either on an iPad or a Chromebook or on your phone. And it's, it's free whether it's, it's uh, an Android phone or, or a, an Apple phone, an iPhone. Uh, so I have my students, while I'm explaining a little bit, one of the things I say is, it's free. I said, download it and install it onto your phones. <laughs> it's very rare that there's a student in my room that doesn't have a phone. Uh, I think this year I might have one student in each class that doesn't have a phone. Uh, yeah, so I tell them, look, download it onto your phone. And then uh, at some point in class, put a run or two onto your phone. And then you can play with it at home. You can manipulate the run at home and, and, and play with different features. Uh, without being rushed. And, and that, that they had no problem with also. They downloaded it very quickly. And, um, and I saw students use it. And they came back the next morning and, and they, I could tell that they actually played with it at home. And so exploration and playing is, is part of, of learning. Uh, it's an important part of learning. Instead of just memorizing what they're told by your teacher. Um, so that's what I say about the cart. In terms of the program, I need, uh, it really is handy if you can project it for a little while on the screen, uh, what you see there. And so I, I show them the Bluetooth symbol up here so that when they do get a cart and uh, they can actually connect. Um, if you go to this, uh, uh, let's see, the cursor, if you see the cursor moving there, sorry, Karen. There's a little wheel, a little geared wheel, it's called system settings. If you click on that or tap on that and you go down to a about spark view, that the only reason I use that, 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 that feature is just to check my version on the icon on, on uh, Chris Park View. 3.1.2 is the latest version. You click on done to get rid of that. Uh, if you click on build, this is how you start. So I tell the students, you click on build. Uh, oh, that's true, it didn't connect. So I'll, click, I'll connect now. So there you see, uh, it, it'll, it'll sense any cart that's turned on, probably in the entire classroom. And uh, usually the closest one to uh, the computer or the iPad is the one that will be listed first. But each car has a number on it, on the top edge. And so you just make sure that the character you're holding is the one that's listed there that you want to click on. If you click on, there's only one here. So it's only sensing that one. And I'm trying to select. I just selected it. It doesn't seem to, oh, there we go. No, it says no devices found. It's on. Okay. It turned itself off. It does save its own battery, so I'll turn it back on. It looks like within five or ten minutes it will turn itself off. So there, uh, so let's try this again. See, now it's connected. Okay. So now I'll click done. It's easy to forget to click done, but it's often that's what, that's what it wants you to do. Okay, so now you see a list of the different sensors. And uh, now you can turn off some of them, and it tends to speed things up. So if I turn, see there's a fork here, there's a position sensor, and it will give you position, velocity, and acceleration information. There's a force sensor, there's a separate acceleration sensor that's not linked to the axle, uh, which, which I haven't used yet. And, uh, and there's a gyroscope in there as well. It gives you angular velocities. So if you turn those sensors off on this screen, 
then everything gets more efficient. And then there's, uh, okay, so now all that's left that's going to be active is going to be the smart card position sensor, which is listed up here. Okay. And so if I, uh, now if I click on build, I've turned off the sensors I'm not using. I click on build and it's going to ask to select, uh, choose to select a template. So I suggest that just choose the top one there. And that gives them a full screen. And then in that full screen, there's different choices. I choose this little icon here at the corner. Uh, it shows a little tiny graph with zigzag on it. That means you want a graph to show up. So I click on that, press go, you have a graph. The default x-axis is uh, time and uh, in seconds. And now there's no selected variable yet for the y-axis or the vertical axis. So you click on where it says select measurement. That's what the title says on the y-axis at the moment. And it shows, and it brings up the active sensors uh, on the cart. And I, so if I want velocity, I'll click on velocity. There it is, velocity versus time. Now, um, there's, a, there's down at the bottom over here, I show them two things. I show them this little icon in the lower left corner of the graph. That's the tools icon for graphing. It's the, it's the graphing tools. I click on that, uh, it expands, and you see a whole list of graphing tools. There's no graph yet, so the, the tools are mostly grayed out. Uh, but there's one you can use right away. The one that where I'm, 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 ho I'm hovering my cursor up, up above it and onto it, it shows an axis above an axis. I can add graphs on that same on that same screen. So uh, and, I, uh, and if, if you hover the, the cursor there, it'll it'll say what it does. It add plot area. If I click on that, I get a second graph under the first one. I have to select this measurement. So let's say I want to compare velocity and acceleration, or let's say I want to compare velocity and position. Uh, so I'll select that measurement, and then I can choose again. So I can choose velocity or acceleration. So I've got velocity already in the upper graph. Let's say I choose accelerate. I'll do that one for you. So now we're comparing, and I can put three graphs as well. I think that's the limit, because uh, they get it's on the same screen. So there's a, there's a space shortage after a while. But now, uh, at the moment, I've got two graphs ready to go. I show them, um, so I've shown them so far the Bluetooth symbol, uh, the build command, uh, adding graphs over here, adding uh, areas on the graph. And uh, now there's one over here where I'm hovering. It shows four arrows pointing away from each other. That's scale to fit, and I'll show you right now what that does. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll take, now, the materials I have provided for my students, I'll just read through a little list, it's not especially complicated, but I, I get a supply of, oh, where's the box for There. Uh, I'll, I'll, I need those cut up pieces of box board is cereal boxes or, or tissue boxes. And so uh, this one has chili in it. Uh, so I just cut them up into pieces roughly a hand and a half in, in length and about as wide as a cart, very approximately. And I just have a bunch of this stuff in a pile. Uh, I have one in the classroom and I've got a roll of painter's tape. This one's called frog tape, but there's, a, there's all kinds of it available at, uh, at uh, any hardware store. And so I, I just show, as I tell the students, leave a roll there, but take, take the tape that you want off of it. And later, when they're experimenting with their planks, if they need to smooth a transition, let's say from the plank to the floor or from a plank to another plank, uh, I say use the cardboard and use the green tape and make yourself you know, a smoother transition from one place to another. And that they, that they find quite easy to do as well. Uh, so I just, and the materials are obviously a bit cheap, so it doesn't cause any problems that way. Uh, now, so there's that material, the, the, the painter's tape and a, and a chopped up uh, box board. Um, and then I have some planks. You might need a, a dongle, maybe, uh, that Pasco sells. Um, you don't necessarily, it depends on, on, on which, which computers you're using. Um, and of course, you'll need either a computer or an iPad or a Chromebook. Um, so that's it for materials. So here, for the planks, 
I've got these old plants in, in my physics lab. Our school is 60 years old. So these are probably 60 years old. I wish they were maybe the entire time. They, at one point, they had a, a, a bolt that went in for a pulley. And, uh, but they're a nice piece of wood. If you're going to use some lumber, if you don't have your own planks, uh, now the, the, there are also the tracks available from Pasco. I try to minimize using anything that looks like lab equipment at the beginning. Again, I, I got, my, my gut tells me it will limit their exploration because they want to be more careful with something that they want. They might, might be things expensive or important. But a piece of wood they don't seem to mind adding around. And uh, so uh, if you're going to use a piece of lumber, if there's a wood shop in your school, it might be a good idea to use the planer. If, if the shop teacher will help you out, just to make sure the service is, is as smooth as possible. This is a nice piece of hardwood. Even though it's 60 years old, it's not worked. And, um, and it's nice and smooth. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I, I make sure also I tell them, make sure they, uh, in terms of the safety of the cart, uh, ramp should not be too steep. Because the first thing they'll do is this. It's way too steep. Uh, there's some groups working in the hallway. Because uh, I've got eight groups working at the same time. We don't be too crowded in the classroom. Uh, so I send a few up into the hallway. It's wise to step out there and see what they're going to be doing. Because, for example, around the corner from my classroom, which is uh, my class is right on the corner, there's a nice long hallway with a nice slope. But it goes actually very far. And uh, the first time I ever did this last year, I had a group that instantly sent the car flying uh, like 30 meters down in one direction. So I said, okay, we'll do that. Come back over here, work close to the door, the classroom door. So if the ramps look too steep, you could use what I've got sitting around here, a box of baking soda at one end to prop it up, a physics textbook, any, any book to prop up the soil. This, is, this here is a weight, this is a Pasco piece of equipment. It's an extra weight to put on top of the car. It doesn't matter. So if I put that at, at one end, I've, I've, I've got a cart, at, uh, a ramp that's not very steep. So let's take a run right now. I show them the start and the stop button, uh, which is all over this green, this green square down here. Now, before we do anything, I also point out um, where it says periodic colon 20 hertz. That's the sampling rate for the sensors. And sometimes it defaults back to 10 hertz, which is not frequent enough for sampling. So it should be at least 20 hertz. Uh, there's a little symbol to the right there. You click on that and you can increase your sampling rate. There's 10, 20, 25, 40, 50, and 100, and 200, 250, 500. That's the maximum sampling rate. You don't need that high rate. We tend to work with 20, 20 or 25. 10 is not frequent enough. The, the graphs are too rough. Um, so I'll say okay to that and make sure it's 20. The symbol down here at the bottom is also a tool symbol. It's got a wrench and a screwdriver across, and that's um, experimental tools for managing your data. If you click on that, a list comes up, and why well, I, I say ignore most of those items, but at the top it says manage data, and then you click on manage runs. I showed them this once, and then they, they remember. Now, there's no runs to manage, so it's not doing anything. When you, I'll show you what happens when there is a run. You can click on manage runs. It lets you rename a run, Right? Otherwise, they'll default to run one, run two, run three. But you can give them names if you like. Uh, and you can also um, delete a particular run or delete all your runs. Because uh, they, they do tend to get crowded after a while. And then you, cl you click on them. I'll show you that in a minute. But that's what I show the students. Now, in terms of a run, let's just do a quick run right now. We'll go, um, we'll go uphill. So I'll, I will... Click on the play button down here with the cursor. I'll try to jiggle the cursor around so you can see it. If I click on that, you see the trace starting. Give a bit of a push, go uphill, and then I stop it, and then I stop. There. So that is a very nice run, actually. What you're seeing there is a zero velocity for a while and the corresponding zero acceleration. This portion over here, I ask my students, what's that doing? What's going on with the cart there? And what's going on along here, along this slope, and then what's then there's a jump up here, and then there's then there's the, the blue dots for the velocity are at zero again. So uh, 
If they have trouble explaining it, I have them repeat it and do it again. Now here, I was facing the car forward. So I gave it a positive velocity, which was the forward direction in this case. So uh, now there was a huge positive acceleration or a significant one rather, while I was pushing the car. And that's what comes out of this after two or three days. Um, they end up with a run like this. I'm trying to point to the screen and you folks are over there. Um, what a textbook would show you is that middle section, that straight slope down, the diagonal line down. They don't show the beginning or the end. The students will get to see that and they get to talk about, and I, if they don't talk about it, I get them to talk about it. I talk to them about it. Explain what's happening uh, during that first peak, what's happening along here, where is the cart at, at the point where that, that diagonal line crosses the x-axis. Most of them don't know it first. And uh, now, uh, if, if one breaks in, in the group of, uh, says it right away, oh, that's at the top, I said, are you sure? I'll make them hesitate. And, uh, and I asked the other students who haven't said anything, do you agree with them? Really? And uh, they'll try it again, this time watch, because they'll see the graph progressing as the cart moves. And you make them look, they have to look, and have to think about it, and have to repeat it several times. And maybe forget about it, and then the next day, they will forget some of this, and then the next day you do it again. But by the third day, we're, we're, we're finished the repetition. But now, if you look over here, this green, the green acceleration graph, there's two peaks in positive acceleration, and there's this almost a steady negative acceleration when they finally realize that's when the car's rolling up and down and they're not touching it. So the two peaks, for the, the two spikes of acceleration when their hands are touching it. And so after a while, they, you know, they do a variety of runs. They see this several times. And um, they don't have any questions. Even when they can explain, oh, wait a minute, no, the beginning, the, 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 the beginning is when you're shoving it. At, at the end, you're actually trying again to slow it down. And in the middle is when it's rolling up and down. And all I have to do then is they seem, they don't have questions, this seems fine. Then I just say, well, wait a minute, we have a positive acceleration at the beginning and a positive one at the end. At the beginning, it's causing an increase in speed. At the end, it's causing a decrease in speed. How can a positive acceleration do both? Speed things up or slows things down. They're stumped. But we haven't talked about it, for one thing. I haven't told them either. And so I'm waiting for other students to tell each other. At some, some point, there'll be you know, about a class of 30, maybe two will have some kind of an answer that makes sense at that point. Most won't. I don't tell them right away. I, I hang back. Now, I have them repeat this exact same run. I'll do it right now in front of you. Uh, but by the way, I also show them up here, um, circling uh, a little um, I, a set of icons there. There's a little box with the check mark and it says run one. If I unclick it, the runs disappear. The data is still there. I tell my students they haven't lost their data. If I want the run to show again on the graph, I try to click it again, it comes back. It doesn't usually actually. <laughs> what I've had to do in the past is come over here and click on the color icons. And then come back. So it looks like it, it, if you're lucky, you can use check the box off again. If that doesn't work, you click the color icon on the right. And um, now, if I want to get rid of that run, just it just doesn't show, but it's listed. I could rename it. Right now, I don't mind calling it run one. Now, uh, so I'm going to do it again, but I'll turn the part backwards. Exactly the same motion. So I'll start recording down here where the green square is, so the, the play button. So I'll play, and there it started. I'll give it a push up, and it's going to roll down, and I'll stop it, and then I'll click stop. Okay? I'll turn the card upside down when I put it down. I remind my students because they'll forget. And uh, so now the graphs are inverted. Positive has become negative. Negative has become positive. And now I say, wait a minute. We have two large negative acceler two uh, negative acceleration spikes. Again, one of those negative accelerations is causing the cart to speed up. At the other time, we have a negative acceleration causing the cart to slow down. They still struggle with that. And if that's not enough for them, I say, now, there's three things to look at here. These two acceleration spikes, they're in the same direction as each other, 
They're both positive, they're both negative, but they're doing opposite things to the speed. That's one problem. The second problem is I got a fairly steady acceleration in the middle. Uh, I'll move the cursor back and forth along there. And uh, so that's, in this case, it's a steady positive acceleration while the car is going uphill and while it's speeding up downhill, all with the same acceleration. And the other run, same idea, just reversed. We got two, we, we got a steady negative acceleration while the car's going uphill. And so that's okay, so it's slowing down. Yeah, but then while it's going downhill, it's speeding up, it's still a negative acceleration. How can that be? How can a negative acceleration go along with speeding up and slowing up? They don't know yet. And the third, the third problem, and I just go, I don't go beyond those three problems for my introduction the first week, is when the car's at the top, the velocity, uh, no, uh, they have to have done a few runs to figure this out. But uh, once they know that when that diagonal line crosses the x-axis, that's the top, the velocity is zero. If they haven't noticed, I just point that. There's, and then it just kind of, the, the graphs correspond to it. They're one above the other. Okay? So you can see there's either a definite positive or a negative acceleration, depending which way you have faced the car. You do both ways. When the velo I said, how could there be an acceleration when the velocity is zero? That gives them a lot of trouble, more than the other ones. And again, don't give them the answer right away. You will eventually if you have to. There's always going to be somebody who says, I suddenly I don't get it, sir. But um, at least the, the students who are willing to engage these ideas and engage what they're working with, they have a chance to figure it out. And then there's a much better chance they will stop making those kinds of mistakes later in their analyzing motion as you go. Um, they'll understand that uh, at, at zero velocity, uh, the car's in the middle of, in the midst of changing its velocity, which is why it still has an acceleration. Uh, so these, these both runs, now if I want to show both runs at the same time, I just reflect this. And you'll see both runs at the same time. It's usually not that useful. I, I like to look at one run at a time, but the students can fiddle. Now that they know what to do, they can fiddle as much as they like. Uh, now, let me sh let me show you what happens when I now I go down to this tool. This is the data tools at the bottom, not the graphing tools. Let's click on that. Now I click manage data. Now I click manage runs, and now I get some choices. I can delete the last run, delete all runs. I can choose a particular run to delete if it's one in the middle somewhere. That was string of runs. Or I can choose a run to rename. So there, that's where they can do that. I show them that, and then, I take, and then you click done to get out of that screen. And oh, didn't work. There we go. Okay. Uh, so if I want to delete something, that's how I can do it. I can rename it as well. Um, just checking my notes briefly. Sorry. Um, No, I've covered, okay. Now, sometimes what I've noticed, less so this year. So there might be improvements, but they are improvements quite a few. They're not just adding features as the new versions come out, but I think it just runs better. But um, still, sometimes it did happen this year too, once. Last year it happened much more often. Uh, there's glitches in the software sometimes. So sometimes what happens, or what I noticed this year was I was getting a velocity recording, but no position recording. Supposed to get, we were ready to record both, but one was tracing out a velocity and the other graph wasn't tracing out anything, which doesn't make any sense. The run was there. And uh, so, and then other times it just freezes, it's not working. Sometimes all you can do is you just reboot, you just turn the, the card off and start, you lose your data. And it's okay, you can just get more data. Uh, so you don't worry about it. Uh, you, you have to restart. Now, the way you restart, Spark view, is you go to the top left, you see the little house there, that's the home button, click on that. And it asks, it says there are unsaved changes, would you like to save? You just say no, okay? So if you say no, it resets, uh, you get a fresh start. And then you click build again, you have to start all over. And, and then usually things are working okay. Um, but remember to turn the cart back on so you can, <laughs> so, it, so they can talk to each other, the software that can talk to the cart. Um, now, in terms of the students, what I have them do, once I give them the instructions about the cart and instructions about minimal instructions, but still just enough with, with, the, with the SparkView software, 
Uh, I asked him to do um, maybe three things. And then I turned them loose. Uh, take the cart. First job is simple. Again, each thing is done with the cart forward and backward. I didn't do this last year. I do it this year and I'll do it again. Now that I've discovered how useful this is. Um, understanding what the negative sign means is critical. All through physics. And sometimes a negative sign in front of a variable means an amount less. But sometimes it's a direction. And the distinction is important. So the way I handle that is all the runs here uh, are forward and backward. Same motion. So last, so they have three tasks initially. They, I say, push the cart at constant speed as best you can for maybe a meter, and uh, or longer if you feel like it. Do whatever you like in terms of the distance, and um, and see what the graph looks like for position. I said, push the cart in one direction, and then reverse, come back, and then turn the cart around. And do the same thing again, forward and back, at, at, as best as possible at constant speed in each direction. And then and we'll see what the traces look like. Experiment. Also, just for fun, pick up the cart, push play, and then spin, a, spin an axle. And you see what you record. If you're spinning the wrong axle, you record nothing. It will be zeros. Okay? And so they'll, they'll see which axle is working. And, and that's, that's instructive. It doesn't leave you any analysis. But I can do that too. Um, so the first task is to push the cart either along the wall or along the floor at constant speed as best they can, forward and back. Uh, the second task is to let it run down a ramp and onto the floor. And that's where the box board comes in. Because my pieces of lumber have about a one centimeter drop in the end. Now you can let the cart crash off a centimeter and see what it does to the tracing. That's, that's not a bad thing to do. And once you see what it does, then you can compare it to when you put some box board on it. One or two pieces of box board. Sometimes one is enough. It kind of depends how stiff it is. Uh, and the green tape. Take it to the floor, take it to, or maybe just to the, to, to the piece of wood. Um, the third task, the third and last task, is the one I just showed you. I, demonst I demonstrated it. What you do is you put the cart down on, on a ramp, not too steep a ramp. And instead of just letting it run downhill along the floor, you give it a shot to let it go uphill on its own, let it come back, and then you stop. And you try that again, forward and backward. Those three tasks, that's what we do for two and a half days. And uh, what comes out of that is a deeper understanding of how, uh, now, we finally get to a, a discussion uh, of uh, a repetitive discussion, more than just once of how a positive acceleration could be a situation where it's speeding up or could be equally slowing down. Um, so what we end up talking about is um, how a negative acceleration is going to add. Acceleration always, I, this is part of the training for students, um, acceleration adds velocity. It can add velocity in a certain direction or the reverse direction. So if you're adding, a negative acceleration is always going to add negative velocity. A uh, positive acceleration is going to add positive velocity, positive change. If you're adding a positive to a positive, you get more positive. Well, that's faster. If you're adding a negative to a negative, that makes it more negative. That's faster. So that's how I approach uh, how the acceleration relates to the velocity. And what we end up with and I, and, I, and I don't just leave it at that. We repeat this every day. I come back in class for the next few days. That if acceleration and velocity are in the same direction as each other, speeding up. If they oppose each other, slowing down. By oppose, they're in opposite directions to each other at a particular moment in time. So at that moment in time, it's in the middle of either speeding up or slowing down, depending on what's happening to the direction of the acceleration. Let me know. The direction of the acceleration can be the direction of velocity. Those are my first three days of kinetics. So I spend maybe mm, the tail end of half a period uh, introducing a very simple exercise, maybe even from the textbook, uh, just so they know what position, velocity, and acceleration are. Acceleration is how quickly velocity is changing. It's, uh, uh, velocity is how quickly position is changing. They know about slope from grade nine and 10. They seem okay with that generally. 
So then we can call velocity the slope of the position graph. We can call acceleration the slope of the velocity graph. And then uh, that's all I do with that. Uh, there's no substantial assignment there. Then we get into this activity here with the smart card. Um, and I found it extremely useful in terms of what it, what it leads to in terms of their, their confidence and avoiding certain errors of mind science. And, and just knowing how position, velocity, and acceleration relate to each other uh, physically. Uh, so in that sense, the, 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 the instructions interactive. They're interacting with the equipment much more than you would otherwise. And they're interacting with the ideas much more than you would otherwise because I haven't told them too much ahead of time. Um, that's essentially what I was going to show you today. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. How many uh, how many audience uh, participants do we have? No, quite a few. Okay. Let me. Uh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll jump on board here. Okay. Um, the uh, we we had uh, yeah we had quite a few participants today. We forgot to do my fault. I forgot to do a little bit of housekeeping. That uh, there is a, a chat window that I didn't explain was available. Ah. Um, for people to pose their questions. And okay, so I didn't, I didn't actually give them an opportunity to ask questions, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, no, that was excellent, Rick, and, and, and a couple things struck me. Uh, first of all, um, you know, as, as a Pasco product specialist, I'm, I'm involved with sort of learning everything about our products, all the wonderful things they can do, all the features and, and so forth. And, and I get tied up with all the, the, the I guess, everything. And, and, and what you showed was, was just simply the shape of a graph, and that's all you showed. You didn't even show, you, you did measurements, but you actually didn't even show um, a quantitative value. No. You just showed the shape of the first, graph. The first few days, we do virtually no calculations. Yeah. Uh, we'll even look at the number, but it, exactly, we look just at the shape. This is the shape of graphs, which I thought was remarkable, and I thought the other thing that was really brilliant is the idea of turning the part around. Uh, and, and the information that that provides the students. So with, with, with just you know a, a one second run of data, all that's there, without even actually looking at the numbers, just the shape of the graph, I thought was, was, was amazing and, and so instructive. And, I, and I'm not sure with you know the, the data that's uh, so sanitized in, in, the, in the textbooks, you know, what, what's actually missing, you know, those acceleration peaks, which I think are very uh, instructive. So uh, I, I thought that was a very, very, uh, Illustrated for me, anyway. Um, the uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, Rick pointed out about the software and the continuous improvements that's happening with the Spark new software. Uh, some of you may know that we have two versions of software: Capstone and Spark view. Um, Capstone is just on the desktop, and it was always pitched as, I guess, the the, the, the physics software. And Spark view used to be just sort of an introductory software package, but it's now getting more features, and it's it's actually for grade 12 physics. It's actually it's got almost all everything that you need. It's actually quite robust. Uh, yeah. Capstone lets you do quite a bit more uh, if you have the budget for it, and you want to look at those details. You, uh, it's I I haven't used it myself, so that's all I can say about it. Yes. Uh, it, it has many more features than Spark view does, but but Spark view has. An excellent set of features, yes. and and um, and I know budgets are tight, uh, but as soon as you can afford it, if you want to play with Capstone, it, it's probably worthwhile. Uh, I'll be doing that later this year, mm -hmm. and, and then I'll have a more precise opinion about it, more specific. Um, but Sparkfield does a fantastic amount of, of, uh, of stuff with not just kinematics but dynamics as well, mm -hmm. uh, and that's when you know we'll do the grade twelves, for example, but even later with grade eleven. Uh, kind of depends where you where where you're going to use pulleys in your course, mm -hmm. um, but then then you can you can actually go into formulas, uh, you do calculations, um, but I think it's important to avoid having an, an entire class period, often they're over an hour long, giving just details about learning the software. Yes. I, I, I personally think it's better to learn it in increments, as as needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think Sparky lends it. So Sparky lends it so very well to that. Yeah, and and there it is. I think Rick was a little bit surprised, but how well I mean, we we have a whole team at uh, Pasco, a whole team of software developers. Uh, I think they've got eleven software developers. It's it's, it's ongoing in the development of software, and and in the past year, Sparky has evolved. I think with wonderful features that you'll probably explore in one of your subsequent uh, sessions. But it's also 
we're supporting five different platforms and and we do have to make sure that we're keeping it a, a solid robust program that, that works well and yeah there were glitches uh, that uh, we discovered along the way as we, we uh, when we introduced the smart card and the software and i think almost all of those have been addressed now and so the, the program is, is in my experience really really solid uh, with the, the latest uh, couple of releases of the, of the updates um, the other thing i wanted to point out is with the warranty i very much appreciate it so rick uh, uh, takes such good care of, of his cards um, but uh, if, if we, we know we're working in reality and that uh, occasionally these things and this happens to me all the time i know i'm supposed to put the card on a stack like this but i often in doing demonstrations people think i'm doing it as part of the demonstration um, i'll put it on this on, on, on uh, go side down, and of course, the, the card falls off the table and crashes to the floor. Um, it's designed to take that kind of use, and and if anything does happen, they're warranted for five years. So uh, you, can, you can be quite uh, secure knowing that uh, at least for the first five years, uh, you, you, you got uh, a bumper to bumper uh, warranty or a magnetic bumper to tail warranty, whatever we want to call yes, it. Yes, <laughs> I like I like your, your tail analogy here. That was fantastic. So Rick, great job. Really appreciate you coming down here. I look forward to you, as I'm sure uh, many of the other viewers here, for your subsequent uh, uh, presentations when I when you'll get into the more uh, I guess advanced concepts of physics and uh, using using the charts. But that was that was a superb job. One other thing, uh, I believe you were going to share some information afterwards in a word document. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to flesh out. Uh, I had, I had a list of notes here with me, yes. and I'll flesh that out a little bit more. And tomorrow I'll send it to Craig. And then I've been told that, uh, that uh, Craig can uh, we'll forward it to the participants. Yes, we'll forward you, we'll forward everyone a link of a recording of this webinar, and we'll also forward uh, the uh, notes that Rick has. And if you have any questions for me or Rick, uh, please let us know, and uh, we'll be happy to answer them. All right, well, I guess that's it.